Um, I'm going to introduce Mr. Rank, who was here last time, and he will introduce Mr. Walton. But thank you all for being here. I hope you get some insight as to business plan today. Is that what we're going to talk about? Business model. Business model. Okay. It's a foundation so. for a plan. Okay. All right. So. Here we go, Mr. Rank. Thank you, Mr. Here. Strauderman. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to see a group come back, and I would like to welcome you, encourage your questions, encourage uh, all my email if you have any suggestions for improvement, because I'm shooting for per perfection. I know uh, I know that's hard to achieve, but that's what we want to do. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to all of you. I understand you're going to get a few days off, so I'm sure that's uh, that's an inspiration for you this morning. And on your desk is uh, resource documents that I have that I promised at the last seminar I was having, as you know, computer problems and so forth. So I've got a new system, so these documents are available to you, and most of them are free. So email me, and just tell me which documents you want, and I'll send them back in an electronic version. Uh, this is... Uh, Mr. Walton's uh, information for today for you to make notes on. And we are filming at Mr. Walton's request. And uh, so if anybody objects to that, uh, by law I have to advise you if you object, we'll need to, uh, when we take pictures of the audience, we'll need to make sure you're not in. So does anybody in here object to being filmed? Or do you want to be a star? Okay, no objection. Okay, great. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning, and I'm going to have to leave a little bit early. Uh, I've got another engagement, but it's my pleasure this morning to introduce to you Richard M. Walton. He is a partner consultant in my firm. Richard is an absolutely fantastic consultant when it comes to in-depth information like you're going to get today on business. He has been a professor in New York City, in uh, uh, New York City in uh, Maryland at Frostburg State University. He's also a professor at the American Public University System in Charlestown. I have been in his classes. I have worked with him in meetings and so forth, and have the highest respect uh, for him. So, with that, uh, I would like to let you have it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for everything, David. Hi, my name's Richard Walton, and um, what I want to do is help guide you in the process of starting, launching a business. And there's some steps we want to uh, take a look at ahead of time. So what I'd like to do, if you notice, I um, use some assistive devices in walking, so if you don't mind, I'm going to be uh, uh, part of the time sitting so that I can see the uh, sitting uh, crossway so that I can see the slide but also uh, see you. So what we want to do today, and as soon as I uh, uh, sit and we begin working, I want to introduce a concept that an adult, and this is what I've been told, your, uh, the name of this class is Adult Entrepreneur Sessions. What I want to do is introduce a concept in planning. And in planning, we ultimately want to have a business plan for the purpose of getting some kind of funding, some kind of market traction. It's like it lends coherence to the, to the idea. And in the model, we develop a way to create that business plan that's going to drive, ultimately drive your success. So I'm going to sit now and begin to work through the slides, and hopefully uh, we'll... Um, We'll see something really interesting that you can use in starting your business. I'll ask first before I do that, is, are there any questions at the beginning? Okay, if not, can you get the lights? Yeah. You may, of course, interrupt the presentation at any time if you do have a question. Okay, so that's the start. <clears throat> Little background on me. Uh, name is Richard Walton. I'm an associate professor of management 
and I've been teaching management, but also I've been uh, a consultant and an entrepreneur. I've uh, started and sold uh, several successful businesses so that uh, we might be able to, or you might be able to, uh, gain something from that experience. I'll periodically share it and I'll answer any questions pertaining to uh, what I did and how you can do something similar. Uh, I also work at SCORE. Does anyone here know the name of SCORE? It used to be called the Service Corps of Retired Executives, and what it is is a government-funded free counseling system. So we have um, about, I guess, uh, 500 clients in the Hagerstown area. I'm a member of the board of directors. I've previously uh, held the position of chairman uh, within SCORE. And I've been there 15 years, and I've been counseling uh, entrepreneurs and startups for that period of time. I also uh, write an article in the Herald Mail, Herald Mail Media. So periodically, you could see that if you're interested in the second Sunday of each month. And here's an overview. The overview is, it starts with the idea that when we start a business, we have an idea, but that's never enough. It's never enough because an idea standing alone without an identified market segment is only an idea. It is not a business. So what we need to do all along in this process is think in terms of the match. What do I have that the market wants or that I can create a need for? This is obviously more difficult uh, when you are creating a brand new need. And maybe you have to be a fairly uh, large and well-funded company to do so. Uh, Apple, for example, in their introduction of those many products that they've made, they were a big company. But at the very beginning, they weren't. You, you know the story of how Apple started up? In a garage. A couple of guys tinkering. So maybe that's the beginning of a lot of uh, firms, unless they're very well funded right from the start. Um, look for solutions to customer problems. I like that idea of looking around for a problem to solve. And what is a problem? It's anything that delays, frustrates, angers people. If you stand in line somewhere or you uh, can't get the service you want or they don't fulfill their promise of delivery on a certain time, those are all problems that could create an opportunity for a business to solve that problem because the people who run that business certainly don't like that situation, but you know, for whatever the reason is, they're not fixing it right away. So maybe you can, but that's the way to start. And again, if there is a special strength, special capability that you have, that's not enough until there is an identified market need for it. So always keep those two things in mind. Here we go for the business model canvas. Now you all have at your desks, I hope, a copy of the business model canvas. Let me look at that with you. Would you all take a look at um, the business model canvas? Canvas is an interesting term in this context. It actually implies that you're going to be an artist to create a vision of your company, your idea, on the canvas. So the canvas is presumed to be blank for you to fill out with your idea based upon the categories that are contained within the uh, business model canvas that you're looking at. I'm going to start with the first one uh, there, kind of in the middle, the top middle, called value proposition. We'll be looking at that in detail in the next couple of slides. But the value proposition is really what you are bringing to the market, and also why it is that a client, a customer of yours, would want to buy from you. There's something that's uh, really interesting about this that uh, I've listened to and, and uh, seen some research that implies that people don't buy products or services. What do they buy? They buy experiences. Now, the experience is the whole system of going into the place where the, uh, the product is being sold, 
but not just having a product handed to you for which you will pay, but rather the way in which the salesperson deals with you, the way in which they answer questions, the way in which they follow up. All these things are part of the experience so that when we think in terms of the business model canvas, we're creating that experience, not just the product market, but surrounding it, the experience. If you look on the left side of the canvas, there are three categories. You see them on the left as people, activities, and resources. This has to be filled in with what you need to get started. Like, let's, let's look at the first one, people. We're skimming this to some extent. We'll go into greater detail later. But people would include staff. They would include accountants. They would include a lawyer, certainly a customer. You're dealing with people, both people that you have working for you, and then, of course, the people that you have to convince to work with you who are outside of your company. Like one of them might be a supplier. Remember, credit. We don't get anything for nothing in this business, or in this, this life, I guess you'd say. Uh, so what I want to do is say that uh, we need to have cooperative and enduring relationships with people in order to be successful. Activities. What might an activity be? Well, something like asking a potential customer whether they like your product, doing some social media work, advertising your idea, asking for feedback. That's activities that you do in starting up a business. And resources, we all think of resources starting with money, but it isn't really the only one. We also need some expertise. We need reputation. You have to build it. You don't have it going in unless you take uh, your personal reputation. But the business has to have a reputation, too. In some quotas, that might be called brand. Who knows what a brand is? Or name a brand, somebody. Nike. Say it again. Nike. Okay, a brand. What does that stand for? If somebody says to you, I like Nike, what do you get from that? What comes out? When you say, I like Nike, the people think, gee, what the heck is Nike? No, they know it. They know that it's what? Reliable, it's good, it's been tested, it's long-lasting, it's better than others. Those are the power of a brand. And uh, can people have a brand? Can can a person be branded? Yes, Trump. You know, <laughs> conceptually, not physically the way you would, not with the, you know. Okay. Uh, who knows who has uh, somebody who has a brand or did have a brand? Ralph Lauren. What does that name mean? Well, he's a brand. He's a brand that he has created in his business of the Western style of appearance. He wears boots. He looks rugged. He's a brand. And, of course, that brand is... Um, uh, making money for him and, and his company. Okay, then over to the right-hand side, we're doing the right-hand right top, segments, channels, and relationships. Let me ask, what is a segment? I'll always have an answer for one of these, but I'd like to hear yours, and then maybe we can uh, uh, make a good conclusion. What is a segment? Well, basically, it's a part. The car buying market, is that all one type of buyer, one type of car? Of course not. Well, the parts of the market that answer the needs of individual people, individual segments. Like, for example, um, what do I have? I have a Kia Sportage. That's an SUV. And that was, I, I needed a, a car that was high enough so that I wouldn't have to crouch down getting in because of my uh, problems in uh, mobility. So that becomes a segment, a segment of the market. I once tried to get a uh, Chevrolet Cruze and I couldn't get in the car. So I'm not in that segment. See how it works? Okay, segments, channels. This is on the right-hand side of your business model canvas. You're looking at the uh, uh, the the uh, top right channels. 
Well, an enduring channel in the past was the bricks and mortar, brick and mortar uh, store being steadily replaced by the power of Amazon and other online retailers. So a channel is the way that you get the information and then you make the decision. Uh, we don't all buy online. Everything. Some things for sure, but not everything. And then comes relationships. Why do we need relationships? Well, because if you have relationships, you have loyalty. If you don't have relationships, whoever it is that you're working with can go elsewhere because they don't have any relationship with you, your company. The final section of the business model canvas is at the bottom. And on the left, it's cost, and on the right, it's revenue. Why is this important? Well, because we want to operate profitably. And in order to do so, we have to know our costs. And usually, and this is a, a fine point we should be thinking about, it's easier to know your cost than it is to know your revenue because you decide what cost you're going to incur, but somebody else decides what revenue you're going to generate, and that's the customer. That organization, that uh, group of people that we want to uh, sell. Okay. So keep uh, thinking about your, uh, your business model canvas. You want to go first to the value proposition. It's the first thing we discussed on the business model canvas. The value proposition, the major issue that our potential customers have that we might solve for them. Can anyone think of a, um, of a problem that, that someone may have that you could possibly help solve? Any ideas? Yes, in back, please. Garage door repair. Repairs. Garage door repair. Okay, garage door repairs. Uh, you'd need a certain expertise for it. You'd want to hit, let me just uh, play this out a bit. Garage door repairs, we want to know whether you're the only person who has the problem or whether there is an existing group of people. We don't just serve one person. I mean, in, in building a market, it's more than one. So obviously we want to know, we want to do some research, and that's part of the value proposition. We want to go around and ask people, do you have a problem with your garage door? And if so, what kind of problem? And what would you like to see? How would you like to see it different? And uh, maybe uh, model uh, the way in which, like my, my son, for example, living up in the Boston area, has uh, what probably some of you do have, the uh, remote garage door opener. Like that, the garage door opens or comes down. I don't have that at my house. but. I'm saying that if you could demonstrate, now you see we have a problem, we've got to get out of the car and, and maybe the thing is going to break, uh, or we just press a button while we're in the car. That's a solution to a problem. That's a value proposition. That's how it works. Okay, let's go further in. Is the product or service that we can supply at a profit continuously with good quality and reliable service? Well, we don't want to be what they call a one-off, a one-shot deal. We want to have a continuous business. This is, if we want to stay in business, we have to have an ongoing market that we are capable of, of supplying. And we supply them with expertise, perhaps with equipment, with space to work on it. And uh, most of all, I guess, the expectation by the customer that we're going to be doing it right that we'll fix anything that's wrong, that's called warranty, as you know, and that we are doing so at a fair price. The problem is going to go away for a price, but the price is better than or equal to what you can get elsewhere, and besides, we do a little more on that as we have better service. So, the last one, why are we the best choice? There's any number of ways of doing that. You know, if you if you are buying more than a, a product made by different people, maybe Samsung and Apple, if you're dealing with a cell phone, but you know, there's so many other things. But you have a preference. A preference does come up. You don't, in, in something like uh, cell phones, you don't go from one to the other. You sort of have a, a loyalty built up. And I think that's what relationships should lead to when they're effective. They should lead from wherever we start 
to a good conclusion of loyalty and continued patronage. That's what we want. We're trying to build that by building an effective business value proposition. So I'm going to hold here for a moment and ask if there are questions related to the value proposition. It's not always easy to create it. Before the Uber came, does anyone connect with? Well, you connect with names through some kind of action, some kind of desire, and a group of guys, who were, uh, ladies who were thinking of uh, starting a car rental service, and somebody says, what about Uber? I don't know. At the very beginning, Uber was probably looked at with a lot of other names, too. But then they picked it, and then they promoted it, and then it became a brand. If they had, uh, oh, here's a little story about brands and names. Uh, Chevrolet, years ago, marketing in South America, they had a brand called the uh, Nova. Anyone know this story? All right, what does Nova mean in Spanish? Okay. How would you like to have on your product, it doesn't work? <laughs> that's what Nova means in Espanol. So, not to be used. Okay, well then there's the value proposition, as we've said. We're going to leave that now and move through the business model canvas. But I want you, before we leave value proposition, think about how you're going to create that, because that's the first step. That's going to define what you're going to be doing in, in an entrepreneurial business. Okay, the next thing we do, I touched on this in the introduction, we're going to be building a structure to deliver the value proposition. So you can't simply say, I'm going to be the best in the business and here I go. Well, you're not going to go anywhere unless you have a structure of people, of activities that are needed to create a business, and of course the resources. Those are the three elements of structure that are going to be looked at. They're on your uh, business model canvas. They're on the top left section if you want to follow this as we uh, go through it. In the top left, under people, activities, and resources. I've listed a few, but that's, that's not exhaustive. You certainly have to go beyond that. So we go through uh, accountant, lawyer, banker, SCORE mentor. I mentioned before that I, uh, uh, I'm a mentor for SCORE, but uh, actually SCORE has 13,000 mentors around the country. And uh, so somebody probably somewhere can help you specifically with the, the business if it can't be at your local SCORE. There's also uh, other uh, operations uh, within the government, such as the SBA. What's that stand for? Small Business Administration. Yes, SBA. Go on their website sometime, unless you already have. And you, uh, you can see a lot of resources and a lot of handy tools that can help. There's another one called the SBDC. Has anyone heard of that? That's the Small Business Development Corporation, SBDC. And they have people who are paid uh, by the government to help promote small business. And then there's all kinds of uh, uh, people and organizations within every community, the Economic Development Commission. I'm speaking of, of uh, what I know in Hagerstown, but I know it exists elsewhere as well. Uh, Economic Development Commission, uh, Business Resource uh, Group, and uh, up until a couple of months ago, I was working at uh, American Public University on the Startup Incubator. Uh, they called EPTIC, the uh, Eastern Panhandle Technical Innovation Center. And that's another organization that is, uh, uh, was set up to um, help small business. They've uh, reorganized uh, since I was there. So that's people, activities. Well, when we think of activities, what do we need? We need space. We need people. We need equipment. We need, in effect, to be in business. Can you imagine? There was once a, uh, a, uh, an ad, and I think it was for uh, the Better Business Bureau, and it showed someone uh, ordering information, ordering uh, products and things uh, from a telephone booth. 
That's not an organization. And, of course, the companies were willing to take, uh, before they uh, became sophisticated credit-wise, they would say, okay, good, we've got your name and address, we'll send the product out. Now, that's a very naive way of thinking today. But the idea was that what would happen is that you would ship to a phantom address, and it would be a loss to the company. That's an exaggeration, I think, uh, particularly today. But what it shows is that there's got to be a structure behind the activities. I'll make one example from my own experience. I started a, a, a business offering um, uh, technical services to the IT uh, field, and there, uh, one of my customers at that time was IBM, customer to be. I went to see them. They were operating out of Boulder. Uh, this is one of their uh, ancillary sites. It's not the main office. Uh, Boulder, Colorado. I was living out there at that time. And um, they said, yes, we, your product looks good, and I think we can use it, but who are you anyway? You're not in Dun and Bradstreet. I looked you up. What's Dun and Bradstreet? It's an encyclopedia of people in business. So if you're not there, who are you? Well, anyway, I was able to uh, get around that, but it shows the value of structure. You want people to know who you are. Remember the old story of... Uh, well, here it is. It's kind of an old story that's made new. It's not who you know. It's who knows you. Okay. And the last one, resources. Uh, equipment. Most businesses require some kind of equipment. We have a, a client in SCORE who has uh, recently set up an automobile repair shop. Maybe some of you uh, could be interested in that kind of a business. Well, he didn't have any money he could, enough to go to a bank and say, give me a line of credit, I need 100000 to get going. You don't do that, you know, unless you have some kind of a track record in, in business or you have sufficient collateral to uh, back up a, a loan. So what he did was uh, he knew the equipment that he needed, and he uh, went on Craigslist. It's kind of an unconventional. I mean, usually people go to dealers who, who make equipment, and then you try to buy it from them. Well, he went on Craigslist and over a period of months was able to source the equipment he needed to start. So that's kind of unconventional, but it shows that you need resources and that there are ways to get them, not conventional. And I want to suggest that particularly at a startup uh, business that non-conventional thinking is probably the best simply because it will get you in places and into situations and ideas that are not conventional. The conventional are, you know, you buy at the list price, and um, you don't buy at list price on Craigslist, as I'm sure you know. You've looked around. Okay, that's the structure, the structure of an organization. We have to do more than that. There's an end result to structural effort, and that is the structure itself. We have an office. We have a telephone. We have a website. We have people answering the phone and, and helping customers or anyone who might uh, come in. But that's what structure means. And then, of course, we can make, produce, buy, buy, and deliver the product. That's structure. And we need it. So the business model canvas in its the relationship with structure is how we're going to deliver the value proposition that we have convinced you you need you want. Before we move on to the next, is there any uh, uh, question pertaining to structure? Okay, here we go. The setup to deliver, and this is now branching off into marketing. Uh, in marketing, we have, I mentioned this word before when we did the overview of the channels, relationships, and segments. Well, Go back for a minute to segments. What is a segment? We defined that before. That a segment is a part of the total market that is uniquely receptive to your particular product or service that you're trying to offer to them. Not everyone is going to be your customer. But what you want is to find and then identify all the other people, all the other companies, all the other areas 
that could be uniquely susceptible to, and, and open to, I don't mean susceptible in a negative sense, I mean uh, receptive, I should have used that word, receptive to your offer. Market segment. And segments can be also identified as to size. And we'd like to know not just who they are, but how many of them there are and where are they. This gets us into uh, something called uh, uh, media, maybe the way that you were answering that question, that you were answering it, or asking it rather, about uh, a name. But the way in which it was identified, the, the way the question was asked, was that the medium through which the name was being conveyed was a truck, wasn't it? It had the side panel with the name on it. Well, we always have to think about not just the name, but how we're going to get it out there. So in this case, it was a truck. What's some other ways? Well, certainly Facebook, certainly uh, uh, signs, advertising, media advertising. Uh, there are unconventional ways, too. Uh, one of the experiences I had early on, I was director of marketing of a, uh, a national organization in Washington. It's called the National Bowling Council. And uh, we had an idea that uh, I think was pretty good. And that was uh, event marketing. Event marketing is you throw a festival. And at your festival, I mean, I, I just went to a... Uh, wine festival so that I know how this works, with, but maybe in your business it might not be uh, so effective. But event marketing, introducing the new product. Uh, Co-marketing, we did this at the National Bowling Council. Co-marketing is, uh, the, the hookup we did was with a bowling center and with uh, Pizza Hut. And the idea was that bowlers, after the game, like to, the segment that we identified, that they like maybe to have a beer and pizza. They go together. So coupons at the bowling center for later to use over at Facebook that give you a reduction in the uh, cost of your next game. We want you back. Remember continuity is always on here. It's never just one shot deal. We always want to say, see you next week. And that's continuity. And it goes the other way too, Pizza Hut. Somebody's at Pizza Hut and they're having maybe a beer and uh, pizza. And where do they go next? Well, hopefully, with a coupon to discount a bowling game, connection again, that pizza and bowling and beer go together. Comes from market research. So now we're in Pizza Hut and we go bowling, and it goes the other way too. So uh, that's another way in which uh, uh, promotion is made to and through market segments. And I think we've also uh, uh, talked about channels. The channel, the big distinction is usually the physical store and the, the uh, internet. But uh, not, everyone, not everyone uses the internet. Not everyone is uh, happy with it. Uh, and some products used to be thought that you can't sell them on the internet. For example, shoes. Can you sell shoes on the internet? Well, ask Zappos. They built a business about it. And actually, it was interesting. Uh, they also sell slippers. And I uh, wanted to have a pair of winter slippers to keep my feet warm because the house doesn't have that much heat. And uh, so I ordered what are called acorn wool sleeping slippers uh, from uh, Zappos. And they came in the wrong size. So I called Zappos. Now, Zappos is built on service. You know anything about Zappos, you know that you get great service there, which is why people buy from them, in addition to the fact they have a great uh, selection. And, and they said, oh, they weren't the right? I'll ship you the right one today. Well, something went wrong in the Zappos uh, communication link between the uh, front uh, salespeople and the warehouse and shipping logistics and so on. And I got another pair of uh, uh, small ones. They were too small. So I called them again. I said, listen, I know you guys have great service, but uh, this is twice now. And they said, sir, we regret this oversight. 
and we will contact you. Apparently, there is a problem in our logistics management of the warehouse and, and our front office. So why don't you just keep those slippers? You don't have to return them. And when we're ready to service your account properly, we'll contact you, and we'll get you the right size. Is that satisfactory? I thought it was. So I now have two <laughs> pairs of uh, small small uh, slippers uh, for which I don't have a need, but it's $100 worth of stuff. And they didn't want it back. They said, you just keep it. I think there's a definition of service. What would most people do? Is, well, you send that back. We don't issue a credit until you get it back to us. That's normal, but not for them. And they built a business on it. Relationships. So it's all connected now, I think. I think we can see that when we think segment and when we think channel, we think that knitting the two concepts together is going to be relationships. And relationships are very powerful in marketing. If you've ever heard somebody say, uh, I go to that store because I like Jack or Mary or somebody like that, and they service you particularly well uh, for the product that you need. And we are want to build that. Now, sometimes it's it's impersonal. I mean, like in the fast food industry, you know, you're not the only guy that comes in. So then it is a matter of training the people who are seeing the customers in, as they do say, every time I've been at McDonald's, the end is when you get your change at the first window or when you get your product at the second window, what do they say? Have a good day. They all say it, and it's always the same. Everybody says it. And why? Because that is the way that they have been told will leave the customer. The very first impression and the last impression are always good. I mean, they're, they're uh, required to be managed well. Um, hello, how can I help you is one. That's the beginning. And the end is have a great day. So that you're set at the beginning to, to buy something, after all, you've come there, you wanted something. And then at the end, you never want to leave angry. One quick story. In uh, Shepherdstown, there's a uh, diet, not diet, Dairy Queen next to McDonald's. Some of you must know this if you've been over there. Uh, they once gave me a, uh, I, I bought some soup. It was a winter. Uh, and they had chicken noodle soup. But it was not good. And I actually uh, went back. I'd thrown it away, stupidly. I should have kept it. I, mean, I could see that it wasn't any good. But uh, here again is service. I came to the window and I said, can I speak with the manager, please? I have a complaint. Of course, the manager immediately showed up. How can I help you, sir? But I got a soup here the other day that was uh, not good. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, here's a $5 coupon. Well, hope we do a better job for you next time. Service. Okay, questions on the setup to deliver the marketing operation of starting a business. That's where we are now. Just about through it. Okay, I'm going to go on. Actually, I have a question. Go. Because, I mean, to me, when you got a large enough business, the margins may be such that you can afford to do that. But if you're a small business, you might need to, you know, have them return that product. Uh, what good type point. Of product is because you know whether or not it is something that can be returned. I don't know if people are interested in new shoes or slippers or not. That, that's a very good question, and often it is said that uh, because we're small, we can't do it the way those guys do, like Zappos, big company and all. And I have to counter that with another idea, which is that you build to bigness and greatness by doing those things. Now it hurts. Just like another factor, we don't have time to get into this, but think about ethics for a minute and doing the right thing. Uh, it connects actually to what you were thinking. But sometimes doing the right thing costs more. We have to admit that we made an error. We have to have let them send, send the defective product back and then we replace it with good product. What do we do? Well, there's a term. You eat the product. You eat your mistakes here. And uh, that's exactly what happens. You, and what it means is that you simply write off the inventory. It never happened. It's a loss. So 
That's, that's tough to do. But I think that uh, building a great company requires that kind of sacrifice. Another side of this, by the way, it's slightly off uh, track, but I think it'll still uh, prove the point. The green movement, the, uh, uh, the environmental uh, people, the ones who are concerned not just about making a profit, but about making the world a better place, making, making uh, life uh, better for people. Uh, sometimes this could be called the uh, social entrepreneur, but uh, we still might be thinking more in terms of uh, uh, actual uh, uh, business that is profit, the profit. But when we do, I think we should always have in mind that we want to leave the environment better than when we found it. And it's tough because it costs more money. Don't you think green products are, are higher cost? Yeah, they are. But if you don't care, then you're diminishing your value as that super guy or lady who can deliver the product, and they do so in an ethically, ethically uh, uh, standard, uh, ethical, to high ethical and moral standards, and you know you want to deal uh, with them, even if it costs more. Question. Even Did you have a question? Even if it's unfair because you're going to lose the customer. Uh, I had an example where I, the, the customer bought a product yeah. and asked me to install it. Yeah. The product was, was incorrect. Yeah. And normally I would take that product, return it for the customer at my cost, and get the correct product and install it. But in this one specific occasion... There are always going to be some sort of conflicts. They can be internal. I want a raise. I deserve a raise. That's an internal conflict. Employees actually demanding it. I'm going to, I need a raise, or let me look at this letter here. I just got an offer at uh, more money, and I'm going to go. And he's your top guy or, or lady or whatever. Okay, that's an internal. But you bring up an external uh, problem. And apparently... Uh, what happened there is that you got stung for something you didn't do. Is that? Okay, the, 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 the customer bought a dishwasher. Yeah. Not yours. Not mine. Okay. You have no warranty responsibility. Nothing at all. The, they, in fact, paid to have the other company installed. The other company came and said, oh, this job is too difficult. We'll give your money back for the installation. They called me to come and install it because I had been, I provided them service before no. and they, they were confident in my service. I came and looked at the product and said, oh, it's the wrong dishwasher for this specific application. Go back and get another one. Bring it and I'll install it for you. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest mistake I made. Because even though they paid me to install it, they never called me back because I did not provide a service of that, uh, or you would have wanted to preserve it if you were able to do so. Okay, so that's uh, that's a quick um, overview of marketing. We have to work on it. We have to be thinking about it all the time. And we go finally to the last element coming to the end of our uh, time here in the hour. And I want to uh, uh, go quickly into revenue and cost. And I want to say first that cost should be looked at in two dimensions. This is not accounting. Uh, I think anybody can do this. I'm certainly not an accountant. Are any of you an accountant? Okay, well, so we're talking on the same level here. Uh, cost, the initial cost. The initial cost to set up production break-even ratios, cash flow, and scaling. Those are all terms that you should think about and you should read about them. What do they mean? Because they all have a bearing on whether you're going to be profitable or not. Uh, revenue, projecting sales and identifying good customers. Any such thing as a bad customer? Yeah, of course there is. Yeah, people who, uh, well, I don't use any names, uh, but... Um, People who always find something wrong, people who don't uh, uh, pay you on time, people who uh, claim that you cheated them, 
Uh, all that stuff happens in business. So integrity should be the watchword going both ways. You should both be a, a, a person of integrity, but you should work with others who are similarly uh, concerned with uh, integrity and honesty. The profit. Profit must exceed cost, not initially. There's a concept, and it's a simple one to work on, is that when a business starts up, because it has a lot of costs to begin with and very little or no revenue at the beginning, it's very important to calculate how long it's going to be that you'll be incurring costs while working toward the expectation of gaining revenue. It's not automatic. It's not immediate. Cost is immediate to set up, pay people, buy product, uh, pay for utilities, pay for the services of a lawyer. But customers, they come later. You want it to be soon, and that's what marketing is about, and the structure to produce and deliver what is being ordered by the customer. That's what we looked at in terms of structure of marketing. Sustainability, quality, and service. Three watchwords. I hope they uh, uh, can become not just the watchword, but the guiding word of your business operation. Sustainability. Just, what does that mean, actually? It means that we can continue doing what we're doing. We're not desecrating the environment. We're uh, recycling. We're doing all those things that protect the environment and earn for us the reputation of a good corporate citizen. So here's the wrap. The job is never done. As an entrepreneur, you don't get to the point ever where you take a month-long vacation down in the Bahamas because everything's fine. It's not fine. You've got to stay at it. Until it's a big company, then you get some time. Keep a record of your assumptions. The assumptions, the initial assumptions, could be contained on this business model canvas. And the business model canvas, I'll suggest that you write your initial assumptions and put a date on the, put a date on the canvas. You know, this is just a piece of paper. But look at it a month from now. You'll add other names. You might say that some things you thought were important or not, but there are probably things that are important that you didn't think of now. So it's an evolving situation. And the evolution of so the process in this context is that your job is never done. Knowledge as an entrepreneur is evolving you as you learn more about what people want, and how to deliver it, and, and how to operate sustainably, fine. Not fine. high quality. You stay at it. Until it's a big company, then you get Don't go it alone. Ask for help. I mentioned before, SCORE, SBA, the record of your and uh, SBDC. These are all government agencies. They're all free. The initial assumptions. You can discuss business plans with them. You can discuss your operations. You can try to get uh, help. Suggest that network right, collaborate your learn initial and grow. assumptions and put a date I thought uh, on, uh, on one of the, the uh, closing yeah. comments that I could make, yeah. which would be quite uh, useful, I think, is that some people decline to really discuss what it is they're doing because they're afraid of what. Not, but probably Somebody will steal your idea. Like you ever thought of that? So <clears> yeah. Well, don't. Don't get stuck on this because your idea isn't everything. How you execute the idea is everything. So if I say to you, I've got an idea for a car wash business, in this area there isn't, I'm just making this up, but I suppose I said all this. And uh, somebody would say, people, I didn't think of that. Maybe I, I think I'm going to get a, I'll start my car wash business before he does. Well, don't do that. Somebody's idea about a car wash is nothing. You can discuss until it is fleshed out, until it shows that they're going to have a restaurant, or it's going to have something with it to make it different, to make it more interesting, to make it more saleable, and then they've got something. One of the closing comments that I could make, which would be quite network and collaborate, is that some people stay optimistic. Really discuss what it is they're doing because they're afraid of what. The road to success, as you all know, I think, goes like this. 
It is not yeah. up down. Well, don't. It is don't up and down. Stuck on this because you're so you stay optimistic at the bad times. How you and execute the It's idea. been a saying, and I think it uh, has so been borne out, to you, that uh, many entrepreneurs, including a guy I'm like serious. Elon Musk, I'm just making this up, what is he doing? You know the name? Tesla. Yeah, Tesla and SpaceX. Well, he's had some tough times along the way. And others have, too. Some uh, entrepreneurs have gone bankrupt a couple of times. But the main distinguishing characters are like the people who are fighting. In this case, you're fighting for business. But I think that's sort of like the ending time. Anyway, uh, they fight and they ultimately win. And uh, I think it was Winston Churchill who said at one time that, that uh, the greatest of the fighters the, and the people who are going to win in the end are the ones who uh, uh, get bruised and hurt, but they get back up. You know, the ones who don't get up, they'll lose. The ones who do get up have a fair chance of winning. And I hope that all of you, in your uh, ideas for a... Uh, a successful uh, business uh, entrepreneurial operation will continue yeah. to be optimistic. Uh, and by the way, everybody and loves an optimistic person. Too. Some, uh, entrepreneurs uh, have gone it's hard to be friendly and nice with somebody who's like saying, hey, that don't work. I, I made the deliberate gram grammatical error when I said that. This ain't going to work. No, it has been tried anyway, before. Uh, they fight Don't go around with them. Go win. around with the others, the and, optimists uh, who say, that's great. Let me try that. that. Yeah, I like that. that. Let's work on it together. A, uh, that's different. The greatest that's up with the, the other guy's going to drink it down. The people who are going to win in the end are the ones who... Uh, well, I've said my uh, piece. Get bruised. Question. question. Yeah. How much yeah. effort in your original business model should you put well, the ones who don't get sustainability? Let's say an entrepreneur is going to start in finding a niche that somebody else is doing. Yep. Uh, maybe it's something new. Uh, ideas do. for a uh, how much effort should it be in your initial business plan of what you're going to do? Continue to Apple, for example, before they sell the phones out the now, they're already working on the next. I mean, that's their business model. It seems uh, to be it's hard to be friendly, thing. but how much for somebody who's for someone in the service industry? Should I make a little bit Well, I think it's a continuous process. Innovation doesn't stop. When you get started, you have an innovation, people like it, and you're going, don't ever think you can rest on your laurels. That's never the case. What has to be the case is that you have a chart, and you say that this time I've got products one and two, and by March I'm going to have products three and four, and so on. There's something called the product life cycle. Yep. It goes basically like this on the graph. Not all products last forever. In fact, none of them do. They last in iterations, like a car from the 1950s. Would you want one today like that? No, of course not. Why? It's still a car. It still works. Think about Havana. They have all the... Uh, I haven't been down well, to Cuba yet, but it would be a, a, an interesting trip because the latest car stop on the road in Havana started. is in 1952. People like it, and you're going. Why is that? Don't ever think because you can that's rest when on your the embargo started. That's never and the no case. No longer they could import cars. Well, so the, the taxis that drive that around the streets of Havana now. Have a chart that period. Anyway, to get back to that question, that this time continuous innovation is knowing and that. I'm going to have products what we do next is just as important as what we're doing now. There's something called we have to keep doing now cycle. as long as we can, like as long as it's good. profitable. But not all products last forever. it's not going to be None forever. And so we have a continuous stream of innovation. In Apple's a great uh, company for that. Like but so, cool, so too is every other company, that, the kind like that you might start. No, if you're starting uh, a... It's still um, a car. It still works. Think about how okay, here's a business, a, uh, auto repair. I guess some of you are thinking about that. My wife bought a uh, road, Volvo Canada, recently and had trouble with it. And uh, the uh, person in the shop said, uh, oh, I guess we can't help you. We don't have a diagnostic tool to give us the information on the readout of the check engine light. Continuous innovation. Got to go to somebody that has it. Well, if you're in that business and you hear that, 
Maybe you hear it more than once. What we do now. Get a check engine life analyzer, that now. system, and we then the promote it now. Because and now you're better have. than the other guys that don't have it. And why did you, how did you ever get but into that? Well, you found a need for it. Forever. Somebody said, and so we have a you know, gee, I wish we had a check engine light so I could patronize so you. So too, you. You don't ever go forward in business by saying, well, you know, I, I'm not that good, but, uh, you know, give me a break. Don't ever do that. Okay, here's a business. Yeah, never do that. Sure. I guess some of there was an old story that uh, the um, way uh, uh, people uh, get their paychecks, a, uh, uh, this is an odd story, story, but it says you never back up to the pay window. Person in the shop said, and what it means is you're not oh, ever, we can't help you. We don't have ever a uh, shame of uh, us the information doing well on the re as an employee the or as a company. Line. You do well because you earn it. go to somebody that has it. Well, if you're in that business, so always keep that in mind. Any questions here? I know we're running yeah, running out of time. Engine, anyone else? Analyze. Thanks for that question. That system's that's good. And then anyone else? promote it. Because now you're better than the I'd other I'd like to thank Mr. Walton for being here today. And why did you have your presentation? I found it very interesting. Well, you found the need for it. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. You don't ever go forward in business by so like, saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm not that good, but, uh, you know. The rest of you, good luck to you. Good luck to you. There was an old story that uh, very, uh, uh, people who get their paychecks. Uh, odd story. I said, you never back up to the payment. What it means is you're not ever... And you did you want to take the SD card out of the Nikon? Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank Mr. Walt for being here today. Excellent presentation. I found it very interesting. I'd like to give him a round of applause. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure. And if electrical could stay for just a minute, I need to talk to them. And the rest of you, in your lunch. Good luck to all.